What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Two Pop to Handle. I'm your host, Andrew Nukatola, your pop culture best friend. And as always, I hope you guys are having a fabulous week because I know I sure am. I don't know if it's like airy season, just like treating me well, somebody's looking out for me, the stars aligning. It has been a huge week to be Andrew Nukatola. Uh, if you follow me on social anywhere, I'm sure you you know why and you've been keeping up, but there's just been so much happening since the last time we spoke. And I am I was like writing my outline and just like prepping for the episode. And I was like, how the hell am I going to fit all of this into an hour-ish episode? Like, there's a lot to talk about. And I actually have a solution already for how we're going to dive this, you know, divvy this all up. We'll get into it in a bit. But while we're at it, let's catch up. Let's, you know, could do a little weekend recap since we last spoke because I've had I had an exciting Thursday night, which usually Thursdays for me pretty chill. I watch Jersey Shore. Used to, I would watch the Traders. We just relax, get ready for Friday. But last Thursday, I went to go see Sasha Colby's stripped tour at the Town Hall Theater here in New York, and it was such a fabulous night. So if you don't know who Sasha Colby is, she is the winner of RuPaul's Drag Race season fifteen. But she is so much more than just like the winner of Drag Race. She is kind of like if you were playing a drag queen video game and got to the big boss at the end, it would be Sasha Colby. Like, I know you probably think it would be RuPaul, but RuPaul is like the lock keeper outside of Sasha Colby's room. You know what I'm saying? Like when you get to like that final, that final level, I can't even think of the word. Um, you get to that final level and there's like that room before the big boss that you have to fight somebody before like their guard it's like RuPaul you get through RuPaul and then it's Sasha Colby she is a huge deal in the drag community she is your drag queen's favorite drag queen like people die for her rightfully so she is so talented and I had such a fabulous time being in New York and going to drag shows of any capacity is always fun because it's just there's so much talent in this city and there's always like you never know who you're going to see at these drag shows like there's going to be drag race alum other drag queens just fun people in the audience and it's just such a fun atmosphere so there were definitely some some fun people to point out in the audience so jinx monsoon was there who is the queen of all queens i mean she literally won or i guess it's a spoiler if you haven't watched uh, all stars all winners jinx monsoon does win that um nymphia wind was there which if you've been listening you know that nymphia is my front runner for season 16 right now I'm obsessed with the bitch. And then Lux Noir London from season 15. So Sasha's uh, season 15 sister was in the crowd. It's just cool to see all the girls supporting each other and like coming out. Um, Teffy was also there. If you're not familiar with her, she just kind of makes like pop culture content. She is, I believe it's in style. Uh, I think it's in style. One of the magazines, she is like their red carpet uh, correspondent and she does a lot of content for them. She, she I, I love her content. She's great. I didn't get to chat with her, but she was sitting like a few rows in front of me next to Nymphia and Jinx and Lux. I did, however, get to tell Nymphia that she is my front runner. We, there was like one moment where she was walking past us and I happened to, it was like, there was an intermission. So I was like standing up, letting people out and she was trying to get past us to go like out, I guess, the bathroom, whatever she was doing. And she was kind of just standing like two feet away. And we earned maybe more than that. Doesn't matter. We like, I was like, this is your only chance, Andrew. Like, you can't go up to her. You can't bother her. Like, just make eye contact and make your moment. We locked eyes. And I like pointed. I was like, I just need to let you know you are my front runner. And I am obsessed with you, bitch. And she was like, oh my God, thank you so much. And then everyone kind of like let her go. So she was kind of running by. It was literally a three second interaction. But as long as she knows that she is my front runner, that's all that matters to me. Um, but the show itself was so fabulous. Sasha is truly such a star. Like, she can do anything. She can dance. She can perform. Like, she was killing it. Her dancers were insane. Like, it was such a good show. It would kind of, it brought us through the story of her life. So, she grew up in Hawaii. She was a Jehovah Witness. She is now trans, uh, male to female. And she obviously has won Drag Race. She won Miss Continental. Like, she has had such an interesting story. She's lived all over the place. I want to say she's lived in, like, Hawaii, New York, LA, Chicago. She's been all over the place. So, just so cool to see someone with such a story who is so well respected in the drag community. Not just Drag Race, just, like, drag in itself. There's one part of the show where she brings some people up on stage and they have a goddess off and they have to, like, 
you know, do they like play a song, they have to lip sync, do whatever they want, dance. And there was one person who went up on stage and they were actually from Sasha's town. Uh, and they, you could just see the admiration. Like they had, since they're from Hawaii, they brought lays and they gave her the lays, which is such a sign of respect in Hawaii, in Hawaiian culture. And they were literally just like hysterically crying, just like so in awe of her. And that she just has that like star quality that like, she's, she's almost like that underdog who like, was born in Hawaii, was doing all the stuff, and then just now was like on top of the world. So such a fabulous show. I don't know how much longer she has. Um, I do know a lot of the shows have sold out, but if she is coming near you and you are a drag fan and you're considering going, get your tickets, definitely go. Even if you sit in the last row, it is such a fun show. It was just like so good. I loved it. Um, and yeah, that was Sasha Colby show. Oh, one thing I did want to mention that I think is so cool because you guys know I love going to see local drag queens and I love to just like support drag at any level, Sasha did something where she let local drag queens apply to be her openers or her like entertainment for the tour. So there's a part where she needs to go do an outfit change and she brings a local girl out. Every single city, she has a different local girl come out. In New York, it was Lana Jure and she is Lux's drag daughter. I've seen her, I want to say at like pieces or three dollar bill i've seen her before as soon as she came out i was like oh I, i've seen this girl her face she, like i could just t i recognized her paint and then when i went to instagram i was like oh okay yeah i've seen her um so good such a fabulous performer i mean she's house of lux noir london of course she's gonna be a sickening performer but so much fun and i just love that there she is such a huge staple in the drag community sasha and she's opening doors for people you know who are you know just getting started trying to make their way into it and a lot of these local girls are so big in the local drag community that like even like to see certain uh, certain drag queens like getting announced for the openers as the tour goes on i'm like oh my god i follow her i know her like it's just cool to see like queens that you might know or maybe it's a new way to discover a queen i just love it drag is such a cool community to be a fan of obviously i'm not a part of it because i don't do drag but just like being a fan of it and watching all these queens and like obviously it's gonna get catty it's it when you boil it down it's gay men um or you know queer people so we're all gonna be a little catty a little petty but for the most part there is like a sisterhood there really is like bonds between these people so it's just cool to see and yeah i don't know fabulous time that was thursday Friday, of course, Beyonce's album came out, and then we actually headed out of the city for the weekend. We went upstate to spend Easter weekend with Thomas's family, so that was great. As much as I love the city, it's always nice to kind of get a breather and just like even just driving a few hours away, just we're not that far. We're still in the state, but we're able to kind of get a breather, and it is such a different world where we were visiting. It's just so nice to kind of have like a break from the hustle and bustle of New York, obviously, see his family and you know, all the kids or whatever. It's just Easter's one of those holidays where once you get older, it's really for the kids. So, you know, the Easter Bunny came and all the things. So it was very fun, very cute. Um, yeah, so that was my weekend. And like I said, there is a lot to talk about. And I um, I have some things we'll discuss, but let's just dive in. We're going to do things a little bit differently today because obviously the elephant in the room, or should I say like the horse in the room is Cowboy Carter. Like we have a lot to discuss, a lot to talk about. So what we're going to do, if you're new here, I usually start every show with my first segment being Drew releases. We start with last week's new music that came out and then we talk about the music upcoming. We're going to talk about two releases from last week, the upcoming releases, and then we're going to dive into Cowboy Carter because I just have so much to say. It just, the flow would not make sense. So let's dive in. So kicking off our Drew releases, these were actually two songs that were not on my radar last week. Not because I didn't know about them, but because they weren't announced that they were coming out yet. So the first one, this is actually an artist who I just recently got into. Her name is Maud Latour. If I'm pronouncing that wrong, again, I just got into her. I apologize. She's actually opening for Fletcher on tour, which is how I found out about her. And she has been popping up on my For You page nonstop with her new song, Too Slow. And the first time I heard it, the preview, I was like, I'm into this. I kind of like it. It's definitely not a song that you can just put on for anyone. Like, it has to be a certain type of person to appreciate this kind of music, I feel like. Uh, it's almost like, it almost reminds me, if you know uh, No Better by Lord from Pure Heroines, like, extended version, it has that, like, vibe to it, kind of. Um, it was such a good song, too slow. It's just fun. Sure, I need to get into her discography more because I'm really liking what I've heard. But that was great. I did add that to my Drew Releases playlist. So if you're looking for it, you can go find that over in my link in bio. And then it was so 
crazy to wake up on Thursday morning and find out that Lord's talking heads take me to the river cover dropped because at the same time that her cover dropped, we got confirmation that Miley and Beyonce were collabing. So we literally, I was sitting at the breakfast table, just picture this. I'm sitting at the breakfast table, or the breakfast table, the dining room table. It's also my podcast studio that I'm recording on right now. Who do I think I am? I live in a one bedroom apartment. <laughs> the breakfast table. Anywho, (laughs) I'm sitting at the table eating breakfast on Thursday morning and I see that I got a notification that something I pre-saved was available and it was Lord's talking head cover. I was like, oh my God, amazing. So I was like, I'm getting Lord and Beyonce all in this week. And there were those rumors about Miley, but I told you guys I was not set on them until they were coming out. And then the album came out in New Zealand or Australia Thursday because of the time difference. And it was confirmed that Miley was on the album. So I was like, you're telling me my top three favorite artists of all time, Beyonce, Lord, and Miley Cyrus, are all releasing some type of project in the next 24 hours. And I had no time to mentally prepare myself. <sighs> anyway, <laughs> Lord released her Talking Heads cover. It is an A24 tribute album. Paramore's on it, Girl in Red's on it, Lord's on it, but only Lord's song had come out. And I loved this cover. It was so funky, so fun. She did a whole little note saying how she was kind of in a rut, red, getting ready for the writing sessions of uh, L4, her next album, whatever that may be. And this taking a break and doing this cover kind of gave her that new spark that she needed. Uh, I really love the song. I love the feel. I don't know the original. I'm not familiar, which I feel like people might be like, how do you, you know, certain bands people get like so protective of and they're like, how do you not know this band? Blah, blah, blah. I don't know. I'm gay. I just don't, but I'm loving this cover. And I was very excited to have something new from Lord. She, we, we don't get much from her. If you're not familiar with like her release schedule, it is, there isn't one. It is just whenever she wants, she puts her music out. Like she's such an under the radar celebrity which I love because it makes it so much more special when she does tour and does release an album so just getting these little breadcrumbs you know in between albums I'll always eat it up very excited for whatever she has cooking up but I do appreciate that we don't know what it is yet because I am so over consumed with everything else in the music world right now but new music from Lord is always an exciting day in my life so go check that out of course it is in my Drew Release playlist in the link in my bio on my Instagram or you can just go on Apple Music, Spotify, and search for Drew Releases. And of course, Cowboy Carter, but we will get into that in just a moment. Some new releases coming out this week that actually all got announced literally today. One of them in the last, like, hour. Um, first up is Megan Thee Stallion featuring Glorilla. They are going on tour together this summer, so they are announcing a collab. I don't have a title yet, but it is coming out this Friday. I love Megan Thee Stallion. I'll eat anything she does up. So very excited for that. Um, Omar Apollo is releasing Spite this Friday, which he has been teasing that song on TikTok. It feels like it's been since 2021. It hasn't been, but it feels like it's been years since he's been teasing this song. So I'm very excited for new music from him. He is an artist that I get into here and there. Like I don't listen to him often, but when I do, I'm always like, oh, he's, he's just so good. He, Um, was introduced to me actually by Thomas because he was opening for SZA and he was so excited, Thomas, that Omar was opening. And I was like, I don't even know who he is. And then um, he was like, you have to listen. So I listened to his discography. So good. Absolutely loved it. So excited for a new release from him this Friday. And then Doja Cat is releasing Scarlet 2, Claude Froyo. I I am such a fine line with Doja lately. Like I loved her, uh, like her hot pink era, her planet her era, like I was all over it. And I lately, she's just been a little off her rocker. She definitely, I don't know. I don't, I didn't dislike Scarlet, but I definitely didn't like it. You know what I mean? Like I couldn't name a song from it. I couldn't really tell you much about it. I loved her first two projects though. So I guess we'll see how this new project is. Honestly, if it's a part two of the first album of Scarlet, I'm not really going to be that floored by it. But there is new Doja Cat coming out this Friday. And as somebody whose music I typically do enjoy, I'll be listening. I'm not sure if I'll be liking it, but there is new music coming out this Friday from her. And those are our upcoming releases. I feel like I just sped through those because... Second week in a row, editing Andrew coming at you live, kind of live. Um, I totally forgot to mention that Chapel Roan is releasing Good Luck Babe this Friday. Obviously, I just had like Beyonce brain fog and was like rushing to get to Cowboy Carter. But new Chapel Roan this Friday as well. We will talk about it next week. And let's get back to the episode. Guys, you guys, Cowboy Carter, Beyonce is here and it is fucking 
perfect. Oh my god, I am getting like giddy talking about it. If you're watching the video, you can probably tell like my smile has never been bigger. What a incredible album. So I want to preface before we go into this that I'm going to record a whole episode of breaking down this album track by track, the promo for it, how she did the Super Bowl stuff. I'm going to break down everything from the Kyle Bray Carter era with one of my really good friends who was a huge Beehive member. Uh, we're going to plan to record that later this week or this weekend. I'm thinking this weekend um, and that will be out next week. So before next week's episode, you will get a bonus episode for me. Um, and it is just going to be strictly breaking down Cowboy Carter as a whole. Of course, I'm going to talk about it right now because I have so much to say. So I'm going to give some tidbits, some of my initial thoughts and just kind of like a little bit below surface level, but not fully dive in and just kind of give you guys, you know, what I'm thinking and my takes and some of the fun little tidbits that some people might not know if they're not a big Beyonce fan. But that episode will be coming out before next Wednesday. So I'm thinking Monday it'll drop. Follow me on Instagram if you want more updates, but so excited to do that. It's going to be, oh my God, so exciting. But let's dive into this album and just kind of give, let's talk about it and, you know, let's get through this because, oh my God. So, if you can't tell, I love the album. I'm obsessed with it. It is so good. And there, it's so good for so many reasons. It's not just that it's like a good album to throw on because it sounds good or the writing's good or the production's good. It is so good for so many different reasons. And it is just such further proof that like Beyonce really is the greatest living artist, possibly one of the greatest of all time. I mean, definitely for me, but like she is such an artist in a fact in the fact that like nothing goes by her, nothing gets past her in terms of like details and every second is thought out, every collab is thought out, every note played on the album is like thought out. It is so impressive. Let's get into this album. So first and foremost, she opens the album literally saying like, there's a lot of chatter in here. There's a lot of talking going on. She's literally saying like, oh, you didn't think I was country enough? I've always been country. Here's my country album. And it is American Requiem is the song I'm talking about. It is such a perfect opening track. The, the, the journey it takes us on as a song itself, it, it literally, like you get such a different little, little pieces of it throughout. It is such a good one. And then this first, I look at the album kind of in sections of like where the interludes are and like the little in-between songs. So the first section of the album, and I'm not going to do this for every section right now. We're going to do this this weekend, but I just needed to point this out on the main show because I was like, holy fuck, this is, if you don't understand the magnitude of the first uh, five tracks, one, two, three, four, yeah, first five tracks, like it is just to begin the album the way she does, it is so monumental. Um, opening it with American Requiem, she's obviously saying, like, there's a lot of talking going on. Everyone's saying, like, oh, it was pretty much calling out the CMAs after her performance. And she's saying, like, I wasn't country and you, you used to rag on me for being too country. Now I'm not country enough. Back when she would do Destiny's Child interview, people would be like, oh, and even after that, like, she would get ridiculed for having an accent. And she was literally from Texas. So she worked to get that accent out and now she's doing country and she's not country enough like everyone just always has an issue with really anything women do but she's just obviously alluding to that um and then going into blackbird right after obviously the beatles song but her going from that and like those messages into blackbird which is obviously a cover of the beatles but the message behind it and before we go further into it i am obviously not a woman. I am not a person of color. I am a white gay man, but I, so I don't want to, you know, come into this space and talk about it in a way that makes me, I don't know, you know, it's, I know that this music isn't made for me specifically. And when I was thinking about doing the album episode, I was like, who do I bring on? And I immediately thought of my friend Gatti, who is a woman of color, um, who I know just from like online. So she's a huge Beyonce fan. So I'm excited to have her come on this weekend and talk about the album and what it means to 
uh, you know, w women of color and just like people in her community, because I know that there is such a deeper meaning there. Um, but just from what I can, you know, the facts are facts. Blackbird is a song by Paul McCartney, who obviously is a Beatle. And the message of the song is pretty much singing to Black women during the civil rights movement. And the fact that she covers this song and features four not well-known, like smaller Black country female artists. She features Tanner Adele, Britney Spencer, Tiara Kennedy, and Raina Roberts all on this track, which is a track written as a message to them, and she included them. She's the biggest female artist of color in the world, and she's giving these four smaller artists a platform that's in their genre. You know, it's not off of the beaten path for them. Like, she gave them this platform. Their monthly Spotify listeners have gone up like 400%, I'm pretty sure, the last time I checked. Like, she is giving them this platform in such a beautiful way. Using this song to do it is just the layers to it is so beautiful. And then to go from, you know, hey, there's a lot of talking going on, Blackbird, which that message, into 16 Carriages, which we talked about a few weeks ago when it came out for the Super Bowl, which is pretty much her talking about is her life, is her career. She's saying, you know, I'm tired. Like, this is this is what I'm doing. It's been so many summers. I've been on tour. I'm, I'm tired. I miss my kids. I want to go home kind of thing. Like, talking about her life and her career. To then go into Protector, which is her first song featuring Rumi, which is the the female twin of the two Carter twins. The first time she's been featured on a song, which I just think about like the first time Blue Ivy was featured on a song back on self-titled. And it's just, it's so cool to see that she is including her children in these projects as much as she does. And that song just talks about how she's, you know, she's the, she's a protector. She's a mom. It's pretty, it's a song all about motherhood. So to go from 16 Carriages talking about her whole career and her life, then going into ta a song all about motherhood and her being a mother, being a protector, to then go into My Rose, which, so on the surface level, it's obvious you can listen to it and know it's like about somebody who, you know, it's, I think one of the lyrics, it's not coming to me exactly, but it's like, even every rose gets picked even with thorns, you know, like everybody has imperfection, not everybody is perfect. And that song coming right after Protector in surface level is like, oh, cute, like whatever. But Fans notice that when you put the CD into a CD player, My Rose comes up as Mr. Sir on the album, which Sir is Rumi's sister, the other twin of the Carter twins. It's, I don't think it's been confirmed, but it has been alluded to in just the way that Beyonce respectfully excludes him from a lot of conversations and a lot, like he's not, he doesn't have a song on the album. He didn't have anything really in the movie when Blue and Rumi did have full sections of the movie. Um, it is, people think that he has autism. Now, again, I'm not confirmed. I don't know, but it has been something that has been speculated. He's really not in the spotlight the way that the other two are. Um, but this song, when you listen to the message and know that it was originally called Mr. Sir, it's just so cute. And I don't know that I'm going to go more into it, like lyrical, lyric wise this weekend. But like, I had to call out that opening five tracks because like, holy shit, we do get the Dolly Parton feature like I was hoping for. She does the interlude and then Beyonce covers Jolene and gives her own spin on it. The fact that Dolly mentions Becky with the good hair in her interlude, so iconic. As soon as I heard that, I was like, oh, I'm obsessed. It's so, it's just so good. And then Beyonce's take of Jolene. My girl was mad as hell. She was not letting Jolene anywhere near her man. This new direction she took. Jolene is one of the most beloved country songs of all times and has been covered so many times. It is such an iconic song and for Beyonce to take it and make it her own with the approval of Dolly, it's just like, it's so iconic, so legendary, fucking incredible. And it's really showing us that she is taking us through this journey of not only to the roots of country music, but of her life. Starting the album, you know, talking about the, the criticism she got talking about motherhood and talking, dedicating songs to her children, then going into the song where she's clearly talking about the affair and whatever went down with Jay-Z and, oh my God, Rachel Roy and the whole drama, like she's alluding to it again and just saying like, that's my man, like you're not taking him. Like she's taking us on a journey, not only through country music, but through her life and how her life, it almost to me is like her being like, 
I can apply this genre to any time of my life. Tell me again that I'm not country music. Tell me again that I don't have it in me. Like, she is Beyonce. Hear her roar. Oh, I just love her so much. <laughs> the way that she experimented with these sounds, she gives us some of that like really original, deep-rooted country music. Then she gives us a little bit of that more like traditional country music that we're used to, kind of like that Texas Hold'em, like yeehaw country, like, you know, banjo kind of feel. And then she takes her own spin on it and gives us like tracks like Ya Ya, tracks like uh, Two Hands to Heaven, tracks like River Dance, tracks like Tyrant. And she is giving us her own spin on these, this country vibe. But that's what she meant when she said, this isn't a country album, this is a Beyonce album, because it is a sound like you've never heard before. It is... Oh my god, it is so good. I am so obsessed with it. Uh, some other fun little things that I thought were really cool and I did want to throw in here. I will dive into them again. I keep talking about it, but the episode this weekend, I will dive more into it. But there was a track on the album called Spaghetti. And at first I was like, why is it called Spaghetti? But then the track was so good that I literally didn't care. And then I actually saw a TikTok this morning uh, explaining that the there is a style of country western movies that are referred to as spaghetti western movies and to my understanding it is a european italian style film that is kind of more like nitty gritty and like not so polished as like american hollywood movies would be so like if you think of old hollywood as even in country western movies um they were obviously country western movies are going to be a little you know, they're gonna be shooting each other, they're on horses, but the style, the way that they film them, and kind of with these spaghetti western movies were a little more nitty gritty, like a little more real almost, so once I saw that, I was like, she is a genius, insane track, absolutely obsessed with it, um, but I really just need to take a minute, I really just need to take a minute and talk about Two Most Wanted. If you follow me anywhere, you already know. And any of my friends listening who know me in real life or like know me more online than just like a regular listener would, you know. As soon as this collab was rumored, I was getting texts anytime that there was more information confirming it. I was getting tweets. As soon as this collab was confirmed on Thursday morning, my Twitter, literally, it was like instantly 10 plus tweets. I had people texting me, I had people tweeting me, I had people DMing me, my one friend Ashley called it my Super Bowl, like, everybody knew that this track meant so much to me, just because it was Miley and Beyonce, but then the actual song comes out, and if you didn't see, I did film my reaction, because I knew it was gonna be, you know, it was gonna be a good one, and holy shit, you can go check it out, it's on my Instagram, it's on TikTok, what a beautiful song. Bias aside, obviously I'm a huge Beyonce, huge Miley fan. The A, just the message of the song is so beautiful. It is so cute. The vocal ability of these two women. Are we kidding? Like they sound so beautiful together. And they obviously are beautiful separate, but they their their voices mending together and like Oh my god, it is just so good. And it is so cool that Miley is on this album because she's kind of gen gender bended. Oh my god. The genre <laughs> genre bended over the years as well. She's gone through all of these different phases. So she has also shown that like her range of genres can really stretch across so many. And to have her on this album, A with her godmother, Dolly Parton, and B she's been a Beyonce fan for so many years. There's so many interviews that she's talked about her. They sang together at the, what is it, Stand Up for Cancer. Um, there's that iconic performance of like every pop girl ever performing from like 2008. Um, there's just like, she's just a huge Beyonce fan also, who, I mean, who isn't? And the fact that they got to do this together, I can't, I can't. It is genuinely one of the most beautiful songs I've ever heard in my life. I have not one note, not one critique. There is, from start to finish, it is a perfect song. Perfect song. And I'm not the only, it's not just because I'm a Miley Beyonce stan, like, everybody is saying it. Like, it is such a beautifully written, beautifully produced, beautifully sung song. And I'm obsessed. We are so lucky to be alive at the same time as a Beyonce and Miley Cyrus collab. 
<sighs> I'm just, I'm obsessed. I am so obsessed. One other thing I wanted to point out before we kind of wrap up the Beyonce or the album conversation, because I just have some information about Beyonce to talk about as well. Um, but yeah, yeah. So I thought it when I first was listening, I was like, this sounds like other Beyonce songs. And originally I was like, oh my God, this could fit in so well with the hold up and countdown mashup she did at Coachella. Um, and she just, she's done it a few, like isn't, a very popular mashup in the beehive and it would just fit so perfectly but then um alicia who is a huge beyonce fan on tiktok she's the one who was on stage to present beyonce's grammy if she won album of the year for renaissance when they brought all the fans up she's just like huge on tiktok because she's a beyonce fan she made a good point she was like this literally sounds like why don't you love me which is from i am sasha fierce and i was like holy shit you're right like this that's where I'm getting the sound from. So already seeing the way that Beyonce is tying a, a genre that she's not usually doing it, but she's able, she'll be able to make these mashups so well. There's so many, so many mashups. You like, I saw energy and river dance. Like there's so many ways that she's going to be able to intertwine these songs together with old songs, with the Renaissance, with all her albums. She is a timeless artist and it is so incredible to see her artistry. I just love her so damn much. Uh, and apparently so does the rest of the world. She has had her, her biggest opening week for an album ever. In just four days, she has reached 213.33 million streams. And Renaissance, just for comparison, did not break 200 million streams in this first week. Now, first, what I'm going to say is, where the fuck was everybody for Renaissance? Uh, hello. Second, incredible. To be, what is she, like... 30 years into her career and she is still breaking these records still doing like numbers that are breaking her own record she had like the the first i think it was like the first country album by a female artist ever to be like the most streamed on spotify she had every u.s global hit she had i think the um i'm sorry the u.s daily hit um spotify chart she had every single song the global one she had nine of ten like this album people are eating it up i'm going to be swinging for my life in that Ticketmaster queue for tickets to the cowboy carter tour but i will be there i'm not missing a beyonce tour and yeah i just uh, i feel so lucky to be witnessing this quite literal renaissance of beyonce in her career like it is incredible she just yeah like Adele said, she is the artist of my life. She's incredible. I love her. I will say uh, just a quick top five. That this is this is loose because it has been changing. Um, but right now, I would say my top five is Two Most Wanted, Two Hands to Heaven, River Dance, Yaya, and Tyrant. But like Bodyguard, Alligator Tears. Uh, there's like this album is so good that like my top five truly have changed so many times by the time I talk to you guys next week or before the episode this weekend just dedicated I'm sure I'll have a different top five but like what a fantastic beautiful perfect album I'm obsessed oh I'm so obsessed I love it I love it so much um that is about the end of our Beyonce conversation so moving out of our releases and into just some pop culture news Beyonce <laughs> last Thursday which was technically Friday for Japan where she was out of nowhere, they announced that Beyonce is doing a signing in Japan to help promote the album. Beyonce doing any type of press is crazy. Beyonce meeting fans at a meet and greet situation is even crazier. Like, we all know Beyonce doesn't do this. Like, this is not something she does. I got out of the Sasha Colby show and saw this was happening and I was like, what the fuck do you mean Beyonce is doing a signing? And sure enough, she had all of her stuff signed. She was meeting fans. Just like so insane. Like, I don't know what has gotten into her. I don't know what, like, where this new leaf has happened, but like, girl, New York City is ready for you. If you want to come do anything here, hit me up. Like, <laughs> you tell me. I can't, I can't even imagine that. Like, I just, I can't, I can't fathom it. Just crazy. I was like, what the fuck do you mean Beyonce to being a meet and greet in Japan? Fucking nuts. Then obviously the album comes out, so far, so forth. And then last night, so Monday night, it's Tuesday when I'm recording. So Monday night, she accepted the Innovator Award at the Our Heart Radio Music Awards, um, presented by Stevie Wonder. I mean, iconic. And just like, it's so cool to see her be doing these, 
this like almost like a press outlet like she's obviously not doing interviews and things like that but she did like the well she did she did the w magazine cover like she is doing not full traditional press but like she's doing more than she usually does and i've talked about this before but she doesn't usually even tell us when the album's coming out let alone do press so for her to be like out and about giving speeches her speech was so beautiful last night she i love that she didn't use it to promote the album as much as she did to just talk about like the the platform that she has been given and how she's been able to kind of you know try this genre and use her her platform to help other artists and like uplift them she features what is it i think it's like five or six um sm and just out of respect like smaller artists they're not big i didn't know who any of them were before i obviously mentioned the four female artists that she featured on blackbird but she also featured willie jones and shibuzi on two tracks or two or three tracks on the album which are two smaller male country artists of color so for her to use her platform to really uplift these artists and to use that innovator speech to kind of just preface how like she knows that she's Beyonce. She doesn't need to go up there and talk about her accomplishments and things like that. We all know what she's done. She, I just love that she's so into giving back to artists that, you know, need that platform. And she's being, she's recognizing people who are talented and like she's helping them kind of like pave their career. It's just, it's really admirable. I don't know. I just, I love her. And like I said, I'm going to do a whole episode breaking down Cowboy Carter track by track, press moment by press moment we're taking it from the super bowl up until this weekend so look out for that i'll post about when we're going to record and everything on my instagram when that's up and i'm aiming for a monday release so just stay tuned i promise it's coming because there is so much more to talk about but there has been so much pop culture shit going on you guys we're in that time where like all the artists and celebrities stopped their holidays they are back on track they're working and before the summer starts they are just like cranking things out because like celebrities typically are pretty it's pretty like pretty much like a lull in the holidays and then in the summer they kind of like do their own thing so it's like spring fall or is like back to back to back to back so we have a lot to talk about and on the topic of music things just a little fun thing if you know me you know I love the Jonas Brothers. I Joe Jonas really is my guy. And he is teasing new music, solo music, not DNCE, not with the Jonas Brothers, just as Joe Jonas, which he hasn't done just Joe Jonas music since, what, 2011? Um, and he, yeah, he's teasing this new project. Don't really know much about it. He released a snippet on TikTok and he's been in the studio with a bunch of people. So excited to see what that has in store. Um, and yeah, I mean, I hope it's good. Not good, you know, <laughs> you, you never know. So very exciting to see that he is kind of doing a new project while they're there. It's not even like they're on a break. They're very much touring and doing things, but I guess he has the time. But <laughs> new Joe Jonas on the horizon. Very exciting. Um, and some other music news, Billie Eilish. So first and foremost, I'm sure you guys have seen it because I feel like it was like the interview heard around the world, but she did an interview with Billboard last week and she was pretty much saying how like, she is so um, sustainable and she is always thinking about the planet and how these artists doing multiple variant of vinyls is so wasteful and you know, all these things. And it it seemed as if she was pointing it at Taylor. She said, uh, I have a quote right here, it's some of the biggest artists in the world making fucking 40 different vinyl packages that have a different unique thing just to get you to keep buying more. That was instantly just taken as pretty much as a dig at Taylor, which I don't think it was a pointed dig, but if the shoe fits, lace it up. Like, there's plenty of artists who do this. Olivia Rodrigo just did it. Billy also released nine variants for Happier Than Ever. She backed that up by saying that those variants were all just different colors, though. Like, there wasn't something new. You didn't need to buy all nine of them to get the full experience kind of thing, um, which is fair. And it is recycled material. So, and it kind of just opened up this question conversation of, like, overconsumption within the fandom and music industry. I collect vinyl, I collect CDs, I've talked about it before, but I don't variant collect. I don't have a problem with it. I don't have a problem with the people who variant collect, buy and spend your money how you want, but some of the artists do take it a little far, and I mean, I'll call out my favorites, Beyonce, Taylor, Dua Lipa right now. There's like 18 versions of her new album coming out. Like, it's very common, it's very popular, like, it's what people do, and I understand, like, it's a way to make sales, but it definitely, to me, when the artist does it, it almost, it seems a little money-grabby, but, I mean, 
do what you got to do to make a check. I'm not going to stop you from grinding and doing your thing. But she's opening this conversation and saying like, if you're going to do it, there's a way to do it sustainably. But of course, the conversation gets twisted and flipped and reversed and whatever Missy Elliott was thinking about because really the Swifties, again, derogatory because they've ruined everything. They, and I, I I feel like I need to preface it when I have these conversations because I am a Taylor fan. I love Taylor Swift. I am not coming for Taylor Swift fans when I say that. I'm coming for, you know, the kind of Swifty I'm coming for who Taylor can do no wrong. Taylor is perfect. Taylor is the world. Taylor is this. Taylor is that. It's, I feel like it's different than me and my friends and my the people who listen to this. Like, it's a different type of fan. But um, that being said, it was kind of taken to dig directly at Taylor then she barely put out a statement and her Instagram and she was like, it would be so fucking awesome if people would stop putting words into my mouth and actually read what I said. I wasn't singling anyone out. These are industry-wide systematic systemic issues. Am I okay? And when it comes to variants, so many artists release them, including me, which I clearly state in the article, which she does. So like, though the statement did come off a little harsh and was kind of taken and spun and pointed in one direction of Taylor Swift, I think the fact that she's admitting, she's like, I do it too, but like, there's a way to do it sustainably. And there is a way to, you know, cut back and do it. And it, it was just an interesting interview. And I, I don't know, I just, I think Billie Eilish has a, she's very smart. She has a lot to say. And she is someone who like, isn't really favorable of the press and media. So if she's giving an interview, when she's giving an interview, she is going to talk about things in a way that like, shouldn't be twisted and can't really be. And that's kind of her coming back with this statement. I feel like she's saying like, hey, that's not what I said. I understand you're twisting it, but can you not take the words out of my mouth and like twist it around? So some, you know, just a little drama from Billie this week, which we don't usually get drama from Billie Eilish. So when I was, when this came across my feed, I was like, hmm, interesting, but I don't think she was wrong for what she said. And I kind of agree to be completely honest. Um, but on the topic of Billie Eilish, she has started teasing a new era. As of today, there's some billboards going around with some different messages on it, kind of just teasing that there's a new era coming. I believe she changed her profile picture. She just a blue image. All of the text on the billboards are blue. So new album from Billie must be on the horizon, which is exciting because both of her albums and her EP that she put out are obviously fantastic. She's like one of the biggest artists in the world. So very excited for some new music from Billie Eilish. Um, and then the last little bit of music news that we have, Lizzo, the other day she posted this whole statement saying she's tired of being criticized. She's tired of the way people treat her. You know, she is a pillar for fat jokes and she is like this and that, whatever. And then she said, I quit with a peace sign at the end. So everyone's like, oh, she's done doing music, which as soon as I read it, I was like, this, she's not done with music. She's just almost ramping up the crowd and kind of being like, I'm done, da da da, whatever. Kind of like a, a, a pity cry and like a look away from people, like look at her and be like, oh no, like we want you in music. Me being one of them. We've talked about it before. I love Lizzo. I know that there's all the stuff going on with the trial. Uh, people can support Kanye West and Chris Brown. I'm going to listen to Lizzo. I don't know. Until she is in court and things are proven that it happened, I'm not going off these dancers saying that the vibes were off on her tour. Like, I'm sorry. Let's wait and see what happens. But um, as of today, she did update and say she is not quitting music. Um, she said, when I say quit, I mean I quit giving any negative energy attention. What I'm not going to quit is the joy of my life, which is making music and connecting to people, which... Again, I love Lizzo's music. I've been listening to her since before her debut album came out. I, is she the nicest person? Probably not. I, I, I'm in it to listen to music. I'm not trying to be her best friend, which I mean, honestly, Lizzo, if this ever crosses your desk and you want to be best friend, hit me up. I think, I feel like we'd, we'd have a good time. We could drink some tequila together, talk some shit. I think, I don't know, regardless. <laughs> I'm very excited for Lizzo to release new music. I'm hoping it's sometime soon. It seems like she's gearing up for somewhat of a comeback. I don't know. I will be seated for it and we will be chatting about it. So fair warning. I've talked about it before, like I said, but I will continue giving these warnings, I guess. So if you don't like Lizzo, I apologize, but I'm very excited for whatever she has cooking up for her new music. Moving on from some music news and into unfortunately some divorce and relationship trouble news. We have a few, a few this week that I'm like, what is going on? What's in the air? First and foremost, we have not spoken about her in a while and I did that intentionally, but Gypsy Rose. So I intentionally was leaving her out of the episodes because I was even feeling like she was getting so overexposed 
there was so much going on and you guys know that is my girl i love her i was so excited for her to get released and when she got released it was like every single thing in the world was talking about her which is great i was so stoked but it just got to a point where i was like i'm going to take a step back from the conversation and let you know let things happen how they do if something major happens which nothing until now really has happened we'll talk about it but i was just like oh my god like there is so much going on that i almost couldn't keep up with it um but she has shared on her facebook that her and her husband or ex-husband ryan anderson are splitting she said um unfortunately my husband and i are getting are going through a separation and i moved in with my parents which is obviously not her mother but <laughs> her dad and stepmom i'm assuming um yeah so some trouble in paradise for our girl gypsy which it's sad because she went through so much of her prison sentence married and dating this guy and to get out and do like the whole press junket with him like literally every single thing she did when she got out he was there he was tied to so like she spent this time in prison did her dues whatever gets out and i mean obviously the main feature and the main story was gypsy and just like her life and how she's gonna adapt to life now and you know what's what's gonna be different i don't know you know what i'm saying but every single thing she did ryan was there so now she's gonna look back on that and be like wow every single piece of press that i did from when i was released from prison with the probably like the most eyes on a case in years maybe in history for like her to be getting released like it was huge and he's there with her the whole time so like hopefully that doesn't taint things for her, you know, <laughs> um, it does kind of suck, and, like, I was full support, I was like, I like him, I think he's cool, like, he spent time with her, with his, her family, like, while she was in prison, whatever, so I was very, like, pro the relationship, but, you know, things happen, and I guess the D was fire, but the relationship wasn't, so sad news for Gypsy, but in other news, uh, Chelsea Lascani, or Lascani, I can't pronounce that right, from Selling Sunset is getting a divorce from her husband, Jeff, which, uh, w crazy, because if you watch the show, Chelsea is always talking about how in love they are, how it was her first match on Tinder, and they ended up getting married, they had a kid, like, she, they, but it is, it's always the couples that are overcompensating, and, you know, it's like, the long, they, there's like that, that story that goes as like on valentine's day or an anniversary the longer that the paragraph they write for their significant other is the worst relationship it, they have like it is i guess it's true i don't know like something was something wasn't right um there was an insider who said that chelsea thinks he's been uh cheating on her for a while hasn't been confirmed like there's not i think it's just like assumptions and the reason it was started but just like really sad like i don't know i love chelsea i really like her on the show i did meet her at the people's choice awards after party and she was so much fun we were in the elevator together just like kikiing and chatting and she was a blast so just sad to you know see anyone split but if he was cheating fuck you you had a bad bitch and you lost her so that's on you um and then another divorce which I didn't even know that this couple was still together, to be completely honest, because I used to love their show. But Tori Spelling and Dean are getting a divorce. Um, I never in my life thought I would be talking about Tori Spelling on this podcast because she kind of just like comes and goes and waves. And like when she makes waves, it's never that big of a deal. But this is a big deal to me because I did love their shows so much. I went through a Tori Spelling phase in high school where I was like obsessed with her. She was like my fave. And I don't dislike her now, but I just kind of like reeled in from it but first they were seen fighting at a storage unit which like why were there paparazzi at a storage unit clearly they were called and then the next day or two days later she announces her podcast releases her first episode and during the first episode calls him to tell him she's filing for a divorce like on your first episode you call him and girl i mean it's one way to make news it's one way to make headlines and part of me thought it was an april fool's joke maybe but it's april 2nd and she hasn't come back from it and after the fight and everything i'm like maybe she really is getting a divorce that's just imagine i came on here my first episode and like called my boyfriend and broke up with him like very weird and just seems very attention grabbing but i'm like honestly i'm surprised that they lasted this long just because i feel like i haven't heard about them in so long but i don't know trouble in paradise for these couples i feel like last year i was saying how it was the year of divorce and i'm hoping this year doesn't shape up the same way but this week is just trouble in paradise for some people um and 
one last relationship little tidbit, kind of closing a loop or opening a loop a little bit more from last week. Christine Quinn, another Selling Sunset girl. Um, if you remember, I was talking about it last week, I believe it was. Yeah, last week about how her husband threw a glass bottle at her. It missed her, hit their son. He got arrested, then went back to the house that night, got arrested again. She has officially filed a restraining order against him. So no news on a divorce, no news on like, what's going on but there is a restraining order he cannot go near her or her son so i i mean you 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 can't have a restraining order and be married and i mean you can but like girl like come on so i'm assuming a divorce is probably on the horizon or they're probably going to try and work this out who knows but just needed to kind of update you guys there just really some crazy relationship stuff going on i'm like is everybody all right like what is going on what is in the air because like girl I don't know. Moving on. <laughs> um, I feel like we've been talking about it every week and this is the last episode coming out, but quiet on set. There's some updates. There's some new people speaking out. And of course, we have a new episode coming out this weekend. Um, Alexa Nicholas. <sighs> so she has been probably like the first and loudest person against Dan Schneider for the past few years. She really did kind of like spearhead this whole movement, which I was totally behind her for. I was like, good for you. I've talked about how I feel about like people using their like childhood trauma on TV shows to like make a point and like make money. When she was doing it, it didn't seem like that. She was featured in the documentary. She was never abused the way that like Drake Bell and some other people were thankfully, but she definitely experienced some trauma and, you know, that's fine. Totally. I'm not discrediting it, but she has taken it now to a point where she is making t-shirts to profit off of these people's trauma. And it's just like getting to a point where I'm like, all right, you're beating a dead horse. She is getting categorized to me for, uh, to me, like Chrissy Carlson Romano and just like, stay away. You are so annoying. I want nothing to do with you. I don't want to hear from you. Like she is just getting it's getting too much. And I, again, I am not discrediting or like dim diminishing anybody's trauma or experiences, but I'm like, you are literally profiting off of the way people were abused and traumatized. And of course, yes, you were in that space too, but to make t-shirts and like, it is just like a nonstop constant thing with her. And I'm like, girl, like go get a job log off, maybe go touch some grass. Like the documentary is out. Like I, I thought that the docuseries would honestly be like the, not the end of her talking about it because I knew that she would always go on with it, but it's not that it would like give her this new, almost like this new, like God comp, not God complex. That's like a big word, but this new, like superior complex maybe is the word I'm looking for and it has just been annoying to watch I unfollowed her on Twitter and followed her on Instagram I unfollowed her on TikTok I was like I can't shut up my god like I need her to be quiet on set because like it's getting too much. Um, yeah, I don't know. But Kenan Thompson and Melissa Joan Hart did speak out, um, which are two huge names in Nickelodeon, obviously, for the 90s. And they both pretty much kind of had the same statement saying, like, we were, this was pre-us. Like, Kenan did work with Dan on all that and uh, Good Burger. But Melissa Joan Hart, when she was on Nickelodeon she was like I didn't work with him like I don't know it's not not my experience but they were both kind of just saying like we had great experiences on the network which it's sad to see that people who worked not that far there wasn't that big of a gap I mean Keenan was working with him and a lot of the people who were affected like it's not like it was there was no overlap you know what I mean like they had great experiences and other people had such traumatic ones so people were a little annoyed at their statements at first when Keenan I read his I was like this seems a little weird. Like you literally worked with Dan hand in hand. But then I thought more about it and like his family was very involved. Number one thing right there, they like, even say it in the docuseries, like anyone who was had their parents involved, like they were pretty much like got out untouched. Like I, I, that was such bad wording, but it, you know what I'm saying? And then I was like, you know what? You're right. Like if that's his experience, that was his experience. Like who am I to sit here and be like, you should feel worse. You should feel different. Same with Melissa Joan Hart. Like if that's how she feels, that's how she feels. She's not saying it's a lie. She's not discrediting anyone, but like she's saying, she was like, that wasn't my experience. I can't speak for these people. Like 
obviously she sends her, her they give their like love and you know they feel bad that it happened but it wasn't their experience and I think like them saying that alone is just kind of like a big a big thing I don't know and then we did have Matthew Underwood from Zoe 101 speak out and he he basically said he's been hounded for a statement and the reason he didn't give a statement is because he was assaulted at a young age um not on Nickelodeon not on anybody or I don't know if it wasn't anyone from Nickelodeon but it was his agent I believe who sexually assaulted him and the reason he didn't speak out sooner was because he's traumatized by his own experiences and like things that maybe didn't fall into the category of n this Nickelodeon series but he had his own trauma to deal with and it kind of just raises the question of like people who are demanding people to speak out about things we don't know their full story we don't know if they had other things going on they don't you know what I mean like people are so quick to be like why didn't you speak out why aren't you making a statement Josh Peck was like heckled for days to make a statement like it you we can't expect people to just make a statement on things and you know it be what we want like yes is it is it the right thing to do in most cases sure but Matthew Underwood he was like I didn't know I needed to make a statement I wasn't involved but since you guys are being you know, talking about it so much. I was assaulted by my agent, not related to this, but in another way. So we just never know what's going on behind the scenes. So just again, sad, just seeing any child star go through things like this, just heartbreaking. We had the last episode this week, and then we will talk about it next week and just kind of wrap it up there. But so sad, so heartbreaking. <sighs> just cr a crazy, crazy thing crazy <laughs> um moving on some other tv news um the roni cast has been confirmed all six original cast members are back i am thrilled uh i was dming with erin last week saying like how excited i am she was like oh my god we're all so excited to be back um just exciting i i love the cast i've talked about them before i love that all six are coming back very excited for that no date yet like no release date but we are confirmed for the six of them and it is just the six of them very very excited there and to close out our topics drag race it is another day in the workroom and i am very upset <laughs> um this episode was the makeover challenge which is another really big one i feel like in drag race it is one that you know you can really show your talents or you can completely tank um it is and it i completely went into this and i was like morphine is going to devour this and unfortunately she did not um i honestly thought that this episode I had a lot of thoughts <laughs> I had a lot of thoughts so first and foremost they are making over the dancers from RuPaul's Drag Race live in Las Vegas so they have these five men come in they have to make them into drag siblings of theirs which is always the name of the game and we start seeing them you know talking to them a lot of them have very similar stories plain Jane really connected with her um drag daughter that's what we're gonna call it and they were all just I feel like there was a good connection almost in the room with everyone I was like oh my god this is like it's cool to kind of see the queens just kind of a they haven't seen anybody but each other for months or weeks however long they film so for them to like have new people come in I'm sure they're like over the moon to have people to talk to that aren't the same six bitches that they're trying to kick out of the competition um so they're kind of just doing their thing, whatever. I think the biggest thing for me is Safira when she is trying to do her dance and her dress won't let her and she scraps her entire look. I, Safira has been a like trailblazer in this season. She has the most win. She has never been in the bottom. Like she is on it and she slipped up. She couldn't use her dress. She had to literally throw it off the stage and make a whole new outfit. And I just think it's honestly cool. The fact that she was able to put something together. I know she got some help from uh, plain Jane. I believe she said were her looks perfect. No, there were definitely something, there was no resemblance besides the color. So that was the first thing. Um, the blue underneath her dress really threw me off. But I was like, you know what? For her to completely scrap a look and still get something together. And like, Safira stunning. Her drag daughter looked great. Like, I thought it honestly was like, not as bad as they made it out to be. Um, same with Morphine. I did not think Morphine needed to be in the bottom. I, I don't know. But then again, I don't know who would have been. I was having a conversation with Thomas and I was texting Jocelyn about it and I was like I honestly thought Q should have been in the bottom 
But then now thinking back on it, like Q did do something out of the box and was honestly very smart the way that she played the game. She did kind of like a campy monster, like not female looking, just crazy look. And I loved the look. Like as a standalone look, I loved it. But I think that my problem is I think of these challenges, the makeover challenge, and I want it to be like your traditional drag showcasing your like true drag persona and putting somebody else in that like nymphia did nymphia did a yellow look and she made her partner purple they were both birds like it made sense it 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 was a, a whole thought out thing you know what i mean q then I, she makes these crazy cool costumes but like she i guess she doesn't really have a signature face like she doesn't really she's not a Trixie Mattel. She's not, you know, she doesn't have like that signature look. Her makeup is always kind of the same, but she can kind of bend it a little bit. So I guess in retrospect, it did make sense that Q was in the bottom because her look was really good and the it was just a smart outlet for them to take. Uh, we get to the runway, they do their thing, and it turns out that Safira and Morphine are in the bottom. Now, I mean there is no way, I don't care if Morphine was flipping up and down, I don't care if Morphine was setting herself on fire, Safira's track record, though this is a lip sync for your life and the lip sync is what keeps you in, there is no world in which they could send Safira home over Morphine. Safira over somebody else, maybe, but I, I just, there is no world in which Morphine could outperform this lip sync and stay instead of Safira in the top four. Like, it just wasn't happening. They lip sync, they do their thing. Honestly, I thought it was a really great lip sync. The two of them were killing it. I really, really, I really enjoyed it. Um, they lip synced to uh, Kelsey Ballerini, Miss Me More, which I love that song. Love that Kelsey was on the episode. And they lip sync, Morphine Does Go Home. So now we are in a top four. We have Nymphia, Plain Jane, Q, and Safira. So, Three of my original top fours are in the top four, so pat me on the back because, you know, taste. Um, and yeah, we are in the final four. So next week, they have to do a book cover shoot, um, and I guess we'll see if it's a top three or a top four. I, I really, really, really want Nymphia to take it. I really want Nymphia to take it so bad. Nymphia or Safira, please. Please, please, please. Nymphia or Safira. Preferably Nymphia, but if Safira wins, very much deserved. I just don't see Q as America's Next Drag Superstar. I love her as a queen. I think she's great. I think she's so talented. I just, she's not giving superstar quality the way the other girls are. Same with Plain Jane for me. She is great. She is talented. She's a rotted fucking bitch, but she is so good at drag. So I understand why she's been in the top four. I get why she's made it this far, but I don't think she is America's Next Drag Superstar. I think it has to be Safira or Nymphia. Point blank. That is my, those are my top two. I am on the edge of my seat for the finale. We have to be what, like two or three weeks away from it. I believe that we have this week. Next week, they're doing like a lip sync thing where they're going to bring all the girls back, I believe, and do give them probably like a cash prize, whoever wins the most. Um, and then the finale. So we are really like three weeks away, I think from the end of the season, which is crazy. Um, but yeah, again, I've been loving this season. It is fabulous. I, yeah, Team Nymphia, vote yellow. And let's get into the final segment of the show, my yes and my mess of the week. If you're new here, I end every single show with a yes and a mess. My yes being something I'm loving and my mess being something I'm not loving. So let's start out with my yes. And it comes to no surprise that my yes this week is Two Most Wanted, Beyonce featuring Miley Cyrus off of the critically acclaimed brand new album from Beyonce Giselle Knowles Carter, Cowboy Carter. I just, I can't say it enough how much I love this song. I, I, it is so beautiful. It is so perfect. It is, again, just two of my favorite artists of all time. The message, it makes me cry almost every time. Like, it is such a beautiful song. And I am very grateful to be alive at the same time as this collab. I, yeah, I don't know. That is, that's my yes. I have, I, there's nothing that even comes close to, 
to it this week. Like, I was really, really, really trying to make my yes something I haven't spoken about in the episode because I really try to keep them separate so it's not like this, oh, we're building up, what's the yes, what's the yes, and then we already talked about it, but there is just no world in which anything else tops it this week for me. Like, I guess realistically it is, like, two most wanted and the lord song the fact that i got all three of my favorite artists within 24 hours to do a release major but like at the end of the day two most wanted is ah uh, come on come on oh i'm just obsessed I'm obsessed and that means my mess of the week something i'm not loving we actually spoke about this person a few weeks ago and they have already come back across my desk as somebody who i'm ready to push off of a fucking cliff caitlin jenner did you forget that you were born male? Did you forget that, that? Did you forget the little whole the whole little transition that you did from Bruce to Caitlyn? Because what the fuck? So if you haven't seen the trans day of uh, visibility was this Sunday, the thirty first. It's that same date every year. It just so happened that this year it fell on Easter. Honestly, most people probably didn't even bat an eye, didn't even give a fuck. But of course. The homophobes, including transgender person themselves, Caitlyn Jenner, had something to say. And she tweeted saying, like, how could you call this day that is dedicated to God, I don't know, whatever she said, religious bullshit, uh, to, you know, to the transgender community, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, girl, can you get a fucking grip? You use the trans community to uplift your story and to give you this platform, you got the Vanity Fair cover, like, you were such a, you even were, like, posting about Trans Day of, uh, I'm butchering the name, oh my god, this is so embarrassing, but what, it's Trans Day of Visibility? Yes, International Transgender Day of Visibility. Sorry that I butchered that, I was just heated, but she has posted about this day before with other trans women, like, you've celebrated it in the past, but now that it's not convenient for you, uh, you you gotta go somewhere like i i need caitlin jenner to just like disappear stop speaking get off the podcast get off twitter just go away go doesn't trump have a new platform you can be posting on or something like i just don't understand how somebody can literally be i don't understand how people can just hate transgender people in general they are literally living their life trying to be their most authentic true selves and you have something so negative to say about somebody who just wants to live freely and be them be themselves let alone a transgender person themselves having so much hate for this community it is so crazy like the levels of self-hatred that caitlin jenner has it really needs to be studied because like mama you are a transgender woman. How are you going to be anti-LGBTQIA+. Like, it, it make it make sense. Literally make it make sense. You are trash. You are scum. And I am embarrassed to have you as part of our community. Actually, I don't even include you as a part of our community because, th no, mm -mm. nope, you are not representing the T in LGBT when there are so many other beautiful, perfect, just like incredible trailblazing people who represent the transgender community so much better, so many light years better than you ever could. And you are a mess. And I just, yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> and that brings us to the end of the episode. Thank you guys so much for listening to this week's episode of Two Pop to Handle. If you're listening to us on the podcast and you like what you heard, make sure you give us a five-star rating, leave us a review. It really does help the podcast. I know people say it all the time and it's like, oh yeah, leave us review. Da, da, da. It really helps a lot. And I would really, really, really appreciate it if you left a five-star rating. Um, if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure you hit that subscribe button, give us a like, drop a comment. Let me know your favorite track of Cowboy Card or down below in the comments uh let's talk let's start a conversation let's chit chat that's what we're here for and like i said i will be releasing another episode sometime before next wednesday diving into cowboy carter so make sure you're following me on socials we are at two pop to handle on instagram twitter and tiktok i will be updating when that's coming out when i record it all of the you know all that jazz so keep an eye out you will hear from me again before wednesday and until then i'll catch you guys next time bye